this person who we're excited tonight, that we have someone who's been uh, a journalist for 25 years, so he's bringing that experience. Um, he's also uh, worked in PR, so he's bringing that experience. And he's also the reason that we're going to be talking to him tonight is he's the managing director of the brand new um, New York Food Lab, which is in Connecticut, it's, it's an accelerator. We have a tradition in Startup Brian. I'd like to invite you all to join me. Uh, we want to make our guests feel really, he's giving me this look. We like to make our guests feel really welcome. So if you would, just rest on your feet with me and help me give a rounding applause to Rick Dorico from New York City. You said thought leader? Thought leader. That's a little scary. Thought leader. Have a seat, thought okay. leader. You also said in your Facebook posting, you said that there was going to be um, thought provoking. Thought provoking. So that, again, I believe I, I used exciting. No one was disappointed, exciting but. and thought provoking. Okay. So just kind of anticipate it. Just okay. expect, just feel that. Breathe into that. I'm breathing into It's going to be good. Exciting. Okay. Exciting. Thought provoking. Okay. Okay. We have fun with these things. So, um, did anybody enjoy the food tonight? Let me just, I, I just want to, was the food good? Did you guys like the food? <laughs> I know I'm a little out of order here, but the food is actually done by Raganese Imports. It's just like a block away. And I'm hoping that there's a little of that marinated chicken left because it is very delicious, but I'm sorry, you thought leader exciting food. I just kind of went there. So um, Rick, I'm excited. We, you know, we are, we're friends at this point. Um, and we have, um, you know, we, we met, when um, I had the pleasure of interviewing uh, Antonio Civitella, who is the CEO of uh, Antonio is here, I'm excited. Um, it's always great when we have our, pro our previous speakers that are here. Yeah. So um, we met, um, you were just awesome in helping me kind of get that event up and running. It was you know, one of our earlier events, we had a uh, a relatively meager crowd because I, I really had no clue no, what I was doing. Room only. It was <laughs> yes, for, it was that was okay in our dreams. It was standing room only, but anyway, but it was a good thing. Um, it was it was a, it was actually a, a very insightful event. Um, what I found is the events that are more intimate really do allow an opportunity sometimes to get a little deeper into the story. So it was an amazing event. Um, everyone that attended the event really had a, had an awesome time. Um, but I like to start these events off talking about, if we're gonna talk about this story, um, let's talk, let's go back and talk a little bit about your childhood. Let's talk about um, what I find is sometimes entrepreneurs. My mom is here. <laughs> for, for Rick's mom, I'm excited that, that mom is here. Don't interrupt me. Um, so, <laughs> so was there anything that took place in your childhood? Sometimes we hear from entrepreneurs that they knew right from the start, like that's my pathway. They may not have known that they were an entrepreneur, but there were certain things that showed up. Talk a little bit about your childhood and what that was like. Um, well, I was, uh, I, I wanted to be a journalist, actually. And so my mom, actually, since my mom is here, I give my mom kudos. I wanted to get a mimi, you guys know mimeograph machines? You guys remember mimeograph yeah. machines? Yeah, yes. So I, I, well, first of all, I should back up a little bit. I was inspired by um, Oscar Madison from The Odd Couple. Okay. To be a reporter, she was a sports reporter. Remember the Odd Couple? Does anyone know the Odd Couple? I do. So I remember the Odd Couple. So Oscar, you know, was a slob, and that was also inspirational to me. <laughs> and uh, my um, my mom wouldn't let me watch. Like some of my friends, they couldn't watch Three's Company because you know, come and knock on my door. There's like his and you know, there's a guy living with sure. two girls, right? Sure. Well, they my parents didn't mind that. It was Oscar was a problem because they thought he was a bad influence on me. And so I wanted to be a sports writer. That was my initial um, interest in that. And so I wanted to start my own newspaper on my street. So my mom went around and asked people where she could find a mimeograph machine so that I could have that as a Christmas present. So, which is not a good thing, by the way, because they're like ink canisters. Sure. So I'm already like sloppy. Sure. And then there's these ink sure. canisters and you can use your imagination. But I actually got, um, I guess I never really thought about it until you just said that. I never thought I was an entrepreneur, but I thought did provoking. start. Thought provoking. Thought provoking. I wasn't, I started my own newspaper. You started your own so, newspaper. So, and I got like five of my friends on the street to sign contracts. Uh -huh. And I still have the contracts. And so wow. I had paper boys. I had, I never wanted to be an editor. So I actually hired somebody, one of my friends to be the editor. I wanted to just be a lowly reporter. So then from there, I wanted to, you know, I worked in my school newspaper, and uh, I went to Voorheesville, and uh, the, the newspaper there was in the boys' room. The old, it was a men's room. 
that they kind of covered over the urinals, so it's really good. Uh, and, uh, and then I went to Northeastern and uh, majored in journalism and worked at the Boston Globe, and that's when I was able to give the bounce pass there to Larry Bird and you know, that kind of stuff. But that was my initial, I just, and my parents, to their credit, was all, were always very supportive and were always, so I know it's going to be videotaped and I, my dad couldn't make it, so I got to make sure that I say my parents were very <laughs> supportive. And, um, but they were always like, really, whatever you want to do, you can do, right. you know? As long as it's in reason and you don't want to be a rock star or a baseball player, whatever you want to do, you right. can do. Right. Just don't have too high a lofty. Sure. So I'm going to... We're going to segue a little bit forward because I know that you are married and you have a parent. You have children, rather. Yes. You've got parents we got covered. Yes. Um, did you find that those values that your parents instilled in you in terms of um, perseverance and being independent, have you been able to pass that along to your own children? It's starting to rear its ugly head a little bit. <laughs> uh, my son is actually very entrepreneurial. Uh, he uh, has a lawn business, uh, D&D Lawn Care. Um, little pitch there for him when he needs a <laughs> lawns raked or whatever. But he you know, he would come back from a job. One time he came back, I'll never forget this, he came back in the house. He goes, I only made 90 bucks today. I really wanted to cross 100, so I'll be right back. And he went out and came back and made like 150, and him and his buddy. And so the, you know, I think that he's passing on. My daughter, Grace, has an excellent work ethic. You know, um, I don't know if she's entrepreneurial, mm -hmm. but she definitely knows how to follow through. <laughs> You know, if somebody says this is what I, and, you know, we need those type of workers too. We need both, right? Sure, you know, sure. Not everybody can be the CEO. And you know, it's interesting that you said that because the word entrepreneurial, you know, it has. I think if you ask three people, you could get three different definitions of what that actually means. And I think many of us, um, perhaps many people here in the audience, you've got that. Uh, I had a conversation with someone last week about the entrepreneurial DNA, and it is something that it is a drive. It does not leave you, um, and it. However, it, it, it flavors itself, you know, whether it's starting off in a corporate, corporate world and, you know, kind of segueing in, into your own business. Um, but, but if you, you I guess you kind of know that you're an entrepreneur, if, even if you don't call it that, if you've just got this burning desire to do your own thing and you may be drawn back, you know, but you, you keep going. Uh, right. it, it really does become uh, interwoven within you. Uh, right. And it's, it's like a fire that just doesn't go out. I think that's true. Yep. So, um, so you're, you're, you knew that you wanted to be a journalist. A journalist. That was something that was in place for you. Um, so talk about some of how that career moved for you. Okay. Uh, you talked about working for some different. You started off at the paper when you were yeah. in fourth grade, and you worked. I, I got know, fired for, by that from that, that paper. So um, <laughs> again, entrepreneurial, sure. very entrepreneurial, that's right, right? That's right? So uh, an entrepreneur only fails when they stop trying, right? That's and right. they don't that's start right. that next. That's they don't exactly start right. that next business. Um, so wh where did you find that that your career took you. You went from journalism, you, you did that for many years, 25, 25 years. years. But it, 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 it was not just in newspapers. You did no. a lot of different things. So talk well, a little bit about that. I worked for the Associated that. Press. I mean, I, I got in, you know, I had, I want to, can I back up for one second? Do you mind? <laughs> mentors. Can I talk about mentors for okay, one second? Because I had a journalism mentor who helped me in getting my next jobs. Sure. And, um, and so she helped me to really, um, you know, Build my resume. She helped me. I could bounce questions by her. What is, does it make sense for me? I had different job opportunities, and mm -hmm. I would bounce it by her right. and my journalism professor. Um, primarily, I worked in, in newspapers. I did work at the Associated Press. I worked covering sports in, uh, in uh, Buffalo, football, and hockey. And then I went to Rhode Island and covered politics primarily. Mm -hmm. And then I went to, you know, I worked in newspapers as a crime reporter, mm -hmm. and that was good. It was helpful when I covered politics. Sure. And then, um, <laughs> and then uh, I also covered, um, you know, various topics. Education. I covered um, business at the Business Review for the last 12 years. And um, you know, that was a, you know, I, there was just a series of things that I think that sometimes you may not realize, like something happens in your life that's actually going to change your direction. I've been sure. thinking a lot about this. Sure. And you know, there's a tell you a quick. It's a long story. I'm going to tell you a little short, try to keep it short. But I had to work on a Saturday. I was work, working down in Newburgh. Very upset that I was working on a Saturday because I've been like seniority there, you know. Sure. And I was not supposed to work on a Saturday. But um, now I love working on Saturday, Tom. Mm -hmm. Mom. <laughs> but in those days, I didn't like working on Saturday. So, um, and I'm kind of mad at God and mad at my editor, all this kind of stuff that I had to work on Saturday. As I'm driving into Newburgh, there's smoke. 
um, and Broadway. It's like the main drag going into the Hudson River. And um, I'm kind of like, and so the, my, my newspaper sense that fire might be a story. Mm -hmm. So I kind of picked up on that. So I went and covered this fire. Okay, just I just have to stop you for a second. Only an entrepreneur or reporter would say, huh, fire, go. Like normal people like fire, opposite direction. <laughs> that's true. Yeah, that's true. Because I was like, I used to be a goalie in sports, you know? Sure. And goalie, sure. everybody else runs away from when something like big and hard is coming after you. Right. But anyway, I thought it kind of lined up with being a reporter. Mm -hmm. So anyway, it wound up being this bodega in Newburgh that was on fire. And I had to get, and there's people who, they were all Spanish speakers. Mm -hmm. And so I wound up getting just grabbing somebody and saying, can you translate for me today? And so she just translated, and I did all these interviews. Mm -hmm. And it turned out that this one woman um, had a baby, and somebody ran inside this burning building and saved their lives. Wow. Basically. So I wrote a story. It was a Saturday, whatever. As I mentioned before, it was a Saturday. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Saturday. Mm -hmm. And um, I forgot all about it. And then about five months later, I'd, I had left that paper to go work at another paper down in Westchester. And I got a call from one of my friends at my old paper saying, you just got an award. You won an AP award. Very and awesome. so I came up here, and that's what led to this. It just triggered a bunch of other things that changed my life and brought me back up here, which is where I wanted to be. We had two small children at the time, and we wanted to be back here. And I guess my point of that whole long story, in case you missed it, is that you don't know sometimes what little thing may happen that could be changing your entire course. That could be a, and it could be a great thing. I was just talking to someone today at lunch about <clears throat> Jeff Blatnick, you know, the, uh, the wrestler. Well, Jeff Brat Blat Blatnick was walking down the hallway when his gym coach, who was also the wrestling coach, saw him walking down the hallway and said, and basically drafted him to be on the wrestling team. And that obviously changed his entire life. So sometimes don't overlook the little things, because the little things can sometimes be the thing. And so I kind of feel like I owe God an apology, because I'm like, I'm mad at you for making me work on a... <laughs> Saturday. Saturday. And yet that was the answer that I was been praying for earlier was sure. to get me back up here. So, long so that's story. pretty, Sorry about that's pretty that. awesome. But I, and I think... Um, it, it, again, but I have a whole hour. So it's I, <laughs> <laughs> I, think it, I think it does. I think it speaks to... It, it is about being an entrepreneur, being a business owner, is really you see a problem. And very often that problem that comes to your attention is because you're really annoyed about something. It's a pain point, right? And as, uh, as a business owner, it's about solving that pain point. And so that, it annoys you to the point where you feel like you have to do something about it. And very often, you put your mind to something and you begin to focus on that thing and it will begin to manifest opportunities. Yep. And so doors will open. Um, I found in my own life sometimes there, doors will appear where there weren't doors. You know, it, it was a wall. And then suddenly, when you begin to put your attention on it, and so that's that's really what it is. It's about you. There is a problem. We're problem solvers. It's about mm -hmm. making it happen. Um, and when those opportunities, it's as important to be aware of that opportunity. Yes. You know, to and yep. and you know another thing about being an entrepreneur is the fear factor. Is um, you saw that opportunity, it would have been easy for you to stay in something that was familiar and comfortable, but you saw the opportunity and you moved on that opportunity. Um, what about, uh, you talked about perhaps being a sports writer in the journalism career, but at some point you decided, you shifted that. It, it, it went from being a sports writer to covering these other topics that you talked about. Yeah. Was there something in particular that made that happen? That's a good or? question. Wow, you're good. You should be a reporter. Um, <laughs> Yeah, actually, it's funny you said that, because I went into journalism, I got to tell you, in, uh, in all the newsrooms in all of America, the happiest place in those newsrooms is always the sports department. So all the other departments, they're all like picketing and upset, and they want more money or whatever. Sports people, we're just happy. We get to watch sports. We get to go to events. Sure. You know, I went to so many Red Sox games and Celtics games and Bruins games. and So... Um, that was all fun, and then the first Persian Gulf War happened, which some of you guys, Peter, you're too young, the first Persian Gulf War was, was a 1990, Chip, 1991? Okay, so that's my brother Chip, a little shout out for my brother. So anyway, um, and then I started feeling like that collegiate, like, seriousness, like, I'm not a serious journalism, sports isn't serious, mm -hmm. you know. And so I took myself a little too seriously. At the time, my byline, the byline is what your name is on the newspaper, so, and when it's sports, it was Rick. Rico, because 
that's a sports name, you know, like Skip, Chip, you know, those kind of names. But then when I became a serious journalist and started working at the Associated Press, it was Richard A. DeRico. Oh. And uh, I've, been ba- I've gone back to Rick. I like Rick. But, um, but anyway, it was the Persian Gulf War, the first one, that really made me feel like I really, this is, and I, it took me about maybe six months before I realized, you know, sports plays a role. Mm-hmm. It went in very difficult World War II even, you know, sports was, a, was something that was needed mm-hmm. to help people kind of get their minds off of all the sadness and devastation sure. that was going on around Sure, sure. So that Good was, question. that I was like a, that. but I mean, we've talked about you in being a journalist and clearly that's something that you love. It's, it's something you have an aptitude for. You received awards, so it's something that you were good at. And at some point, um, you changed. Uh, still, still, you know, I under, I, I'm watching you now. It's like all you can do to not just wrest control of this interview from me. You can barely stand it, I can tell. So so it's it's not just like you were a journalist. It's like journal, journalism is in you. It's kind of uh, defines who you are. And yet there was a shift that took place. So how did that shift come about? Well, that's a good question, too. Well, it's a lot of these people in this room, I would say, actually. Tony is one of them. Um, Dan Young, there's a bunch of people here, uh, Dash, Gable Jesse, Brian Celtic, some of those guys, um, that you cover people, well, two things happened. One happened where I was just kind of like, I don't know if you've been doing the same thing over and over again, you start to feel like um, you're an automatic pilot, mm-hmm. almost. So I was starting to feel like I'd written the same story. It was almost like, you know, at some point something light goes off and you're like, I'm not really feeling like I'm growing in here. I'm not really mm-hmm. feeling challenged. Mm-hmm. And so that was part of it. And then the other part was all the people I was mentioning, that wasn't, that was, they were not boring at all. So I want to make sure I highlight that. <laughs> but that, um, I, I was, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hear about this later. Um, I was um, inspired, really, by when you, there's a little thing I tell people, and that is like, there's an occupational hazard in journalism. Okay, so in, in most fields in journalism, if you cover like education, you want to be an educator. So a lot of people really do literally leave journalism and become teachers. People who cover law actually do become lawyers. It happens. Again, I, the joke is, you know, they don't, in pe- politics, actually people leave and go into politics. Al Gore, you know, we have, he was a newspaper guy. And so I don't know what was worse than that case. And then, um, I'm sorry, I left something for this. And then, um, <laughs> you know, and then, um, you know, I, Reporters, the only one that's different is sports, actually. Sports is usually guys that couldn't make it into sports. <laughs> <laughs> but, Why are you keep um, pointing at me when it's the failure one? You said and... No, no, I was... But, um, but when you cover entrepreneurs, I found myself becoming very, very inspired by the entrepreneurs and um, their stories. I would come back to the office. Sometimes it would drive my editor crazy because I'd come back and just talk about... He's like, are you going to get back to your desk and start writing some of these things down? But I wanted, they just motivated me. They were very sure. exciting. Sure. And so that's, I guess, where I started to feel like, I was going to print this quote out, I forgot it. But there's a quote from uh, Teddy Roosevelt, and I'm going to really mess it up. But it, the idea about um, the credit really does not go to the critic who stands on the sidelines and is pointing <laughs> out all the things that are wrong, but the guy who's in the ring and, um, and who's doing it. And so at some point, I was really starting to feel like, you know, journalism, and I love journalism, I really do love journalism. Um, you're always on the sidelines. Mm-hmm. You know, you're always recording history. Sure. And part of me wanted to get in the game. Sure. And that's why I'm feel hugely privileged to be working with Tony, with Transfinder, but also because that's in the game for sure. Sure. And then the Biz Lab is going to change. It's not just other people doing things. I'm writing about it, but it's actually we are putting something together that I really sure. do truly believe is going to be transformational. So it was journalism, and then you took a little journey into PR, which kind of flows, and then making the switch to being the managing director um, of New York Biz Lab. And so let's talk a little bit about even <coughs> there being a space created for the New York Biz Lab. And I think that relates probably to what we're seeing about entrepreneurship in, you know, in New York State, not just in our region, even though we're known as Tech Valley, but it's, it's, it's going all over the state. But in Schenectady in particular, um, there has been some uh, transformation, some changes that have taken place. Talk a little bit about how that plays into... Well, Schenectady is a totally different place than it was five years ago, Mm -hmm. definitely 10 years ago. Um, The mayor likes to make a joke about 
you know, five years ago, I could walk across the street without looking both ways, not worry about it. You know, now it's a, it's a booming place. You know, things are happening. It starts with one person making an investment, another person making, you know, the restaurants coming in there before, you know, um, before there's really a lot of workers downtown to even support that. Um, what I like about what's happening with us is that, so TransFinder is really like the last investment on the 400 block. The 400 block is the premier block right now, right now on State Street. Mm -hmm. That's where Proctor's is. That's where, and so we were like really the last major investment on the 400 block. Mm -hmm. And then Tony really, it is to his credit that, you know, he's investing in the 200 block. People who look at the 400 block now, it's a no brainer. They're like, gee, I wish I got in it. Well, that's what people who are risk takers. I'm by the way, I'm a, I'm a really big risk taker with other people's money. I am very, very, I take a lot of chances. I love like that. Um, I like that. But, but so it's easy to look at like the 400 block and go, why, oh yeah, we definitely should do that. You know, you know, Quirky came, yeah, Quirky came late in the game. Mm -hmm. No offense to Quirky, you know, we love Quirky. But the thing is, that happened as a result of a lot of other things happening, sure. including TransFinder's decision to, you know, build in downtown. 200 block, I really do believe is going to be the next thing. So Tony kind of likes this idea, and I do too. The synergy, I do still think in stories, really. Mm -hmm. The bookends, last investment, 400 block, first investment, 200 block. And and there's a, and that's going to be transformative. You go down right now to 200 block, no one's writing home about 200 block right now. Mm -hmm. I believe in a year they will. Okay, and, and the uh, New York Biz Lab is going to be a part of that. Huge part of that. And let's, let's talk, I mean, we often hear the terms incubator and accelerator bandied about, and they're often used interchangeably, but they're really not the same thing. So talk a little bit about the difference between the two and what, what the biz lab is. And this is one of those ones where you could also ask a few sure, people here and sure. they probably give different answers. Sure. Our kind of interpretation, the way we kind of look at it is, and there's room for both in the biz, biz lab. Incubator, I think, is more of a very early stage company. Mm -hmm. um, they may have a product, but they may not be revenue generating yet. Mm -hmm. They may not have any clients yet. It really, it's a little further than two guys and an idea, two gals and an idea. Um, but it's still a lot earlier, um, earlier stage. And then an accelerator, I really view as a company that's a little further along, mm -hmm. but they still don't have some things that they need in place, like strong advisors. Maybe they need investment. Um, maybe they need help with a business plan or a strategy or introductions, really, to potential clients and that kind of thing. So an accelerator is much more of a, and I, and I think the biz lab, and I shouldn't say I think, it, the biz lab is really a combo. The focus is on accelerator, um, but to help companies you know, get what they need. You know, when you're in a, when I used to cover for the business review, I covered um, the RPI incubator. Mm -hmm. And um, Esther's here. She oversees that whole program. Esther, where are you? We'll shout out to Esther. Okay. Um, Esther Vargas, who's new to the area. And um, I would go to the, the uh, you know, there was a physical location, the J building. Mm -hmm. And um, I would go and knock on doors and annoy people and come back with like 10 stories, usually. And I'm not making that up. I'd literally come back with 10 stories. And many of those people wound up becoming companies that we all know. Um, Map Info, um, Vicarious Visions, mm -hmm. Transmedia, and those. Um, I think I lost my train of thought. Yeah. Can we <laughs> rewind the tape? We were talking place? about. Uh, we were. We were. We were just talking about um, incubators uh, okay. versus accelerators, and and how that fit, how Biz Lab, New York Biz Lab, fits in with that. Right. So the goal is to try to find those type of companies mm -hmm. and give them what they need. And oh, that's what I was going to say. I got it. So a lot of those companies that I would cover were um, so busy, and a lot of these guys can relate to this, with their heads down, sure. doing the job, sure. not to be able to look up. And I would come by sometimes and tell them, oh, you know, this company over here is doing something that might be complementary to what you're doing, or this. And they go, oh, really? We didn't even know they existed. And so I would kind of joke, like, it's a little value add by the business review to help you guys connect. But that became part of what we're doing here at the Biz Lab, really, is we are connecting um, people with clients with um, you know, technology, with mm -hmm. funding. And key to me above all of those really is advisors. I believe very strongly in the importance of good advisors who have been around the block a few times. Like David Justin. You've been around the block a few times. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. So. So, so is the Biz Lab actually open yet? The Biz Lab is uh, being renovated mm -hmm. and um, we have we have a client that could move in any day now. Mm -hmm. So, and they're going through the process of the Startup New York program. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Mm -hmm. The uh, 
you know, we have 6,000 square feet of space mm -hmm. that's part of the Startup New York program. So that's mm -hmm. tax incentives, um, you know, no taxes mm -hmm. on those new employees for 10 years. Mm -hmm. So we have, it could be any day now. Okay. So if I am, a, if I'm, I'm, I'm in the audience and I'm here, I'm like, this, this biz lab sounds great, you know, New York biz lab, I want to be a part of that 200 block. So as a, as a company um, or someone perhaps is still in the idea stage, still in the discovery stage. What, how would I need to be positioning myself? What are the, some of the things that I would need to be doing if I wanted to be a part of New York Biz Lab? Um, I guess it would start with conversations, really, about what it is they're going for, because we do have a niche of, of specialty. So if they were making a certain type of widget, we, I would still like to, I like to help people connect. Sure. So I would still want to be involved in helping. But in terms of actually being in that space, it would be important to know, the first thing we do, we have some people who are, have gone through the process, you know, want to know what's your market, what's your pain point, what are you, you know, what are you trying to accomplish basically, and then do we, do, is this a good fit? Mm -hmm. So like our focus is education technology or ed tech. Okay. So it's anybody who's selling for tech, you know, technology, but for the K through 12 market, okay? Because that's our, as TransFinder, and the one thing I really do like about the Biz Lab is that it's not, and no, folk, no offense, Esther, by the way, don't take the tell James. Is. But it's not connected to an educational institution per se. Sure. We do have a strong relationship with the colleges, union, you know, RPI, CCC, by virtue of our relationships. But um, it's TransFinder. It's backed by an entrepreneur, Tony, mm -hmm. and, you know, TransFinder. But we have, we're, the, you know, we're market leaders in selling to the K-12 market. So if you have a, K, you have a product for that market, we can get you connected to customers. So that's one of the strengths that we provide. Then the next level is anybody that has a tech, you know, um, product. So you're a software developer, you're an app developer. That fits in logistics because that's what TransFinder. TransFinder, you know, we basically are routing uh, students mm -hmm. to school. Mm -hmm. So anybody who has a logistics issue, that's something that we can also be support. So those are the. So if somebody came in and had something that was kind of outside of that. That's when you have to make hard decisions, and you still sure. want to be friendly and everything with everybody. Sure. But it just may not be a good fit to be in that building. Sure. Does that so answer your question? It does, and it leads to my next question, which is: So, what would be the profile of what kind of companies is is New York Biz Lab looking for? You want me to name a company? No, well, okay. not. I mean, no. Well, a company just that the type of. A, well, I mean, a company that may have a uh, software, an educational software, okay. for instance. Okay. So they want to get into schools, and we have a okay. great relationship with superintendents. Okay. So, so you, so you, so I guess what I'm, what I'm trying to get clear on, you are interested in companies that are not necessarily solid and formed yet. If they're still in that kind of forming stage, but they have a pretty good idea, you're open to those kind of conversations. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Yep. Someone might ask, and I get this question sometimes, how how did you get to start a grind? You were at the legislature, you know, what was that pathway? And what you were a journalist. <laughs> Well, let's, let's talk about that pathway. <laughs> well, we can talk about that pathway after after we talk about your pathway. <laughs> so you you were you know to go from journalism to managing director, and you talked a little bit about you talked about your path in journalism and kind of how you got to that. But was there was there just a a, a moment when you just said yeah it makes sense? I know you were covering business and you were covering entrepreneurship, but was there you know trans would you say skills? I'm looking at what I learned as a journalist, and I'm. Uh, looking at what I do as a managing director, are there transferable things? That oh you yes, see in definitely. Place? I thought you were going to say like, because I really kind of, I mean, again, I don't want to sound like I'm kissing up to the boss who's in the audience because <laughs> it can go too far. You can go too far with that. You know, um, I don't know if I've gone too far yet. A little bit. Okay. Uh, but I mean, Tony, I got to give Tony a lot of credit. Okay, mm -hmm. so because Tony um, said he saw the things that my connections with the tech community. When I, you know, so going back, uh, let's just back up a year ago, um, I was involved with a team from RPI, mm -hmm. which Esther is involved in this year as well, with this organ this event called BOSS, which is a month, a month now, November 12th, by the way, everybody, mark your calendars. And so BOSS, basically we had 81, you know, speakers, and mostly like 60 something CEOs mm -hmm. um, speaking for five minutes on one stage in one day. So it was, Crazy, and it ended on time, and it was great. And so Tony was one of the speakers in that, and that was where we just kind of reconnected. Hanging in Tony's office is a story I wrote on him back in 2003. So it's kind of weird to see these things kind of sure. come around. Sure. But um, I think in terms of so he saw something that you know it wasn't like I applied for the job uh -huh. basically. It was more like 
I think I definitely can do this. Yeah. I think that I have learned from every single person in this room and others that I've interviewed. I always, mm -hmm. I told um, the publisher of the Business Review when I left that I felt like I got a mini MBA at the Business Review by all the things I learned from so many very, very smart um, entrepreneurs. And she goes, I don't, I think you might have even, it may even be a mini MBA, maybe an MBA, you know? So that's helped me. And then mm -hmm. there's the connections as well, but it's both of those things that I think has helped me. I still believe that you, you know, you learn every day, you learn from your mistakes. I always, this is one of my kind of favorite expressions is that I will never be the smartest guy in the room. Sure. Ever. And most people could probably yell an amen to that if you know me. And, um, but I know how to get this, I don't even belong in the room. I don't belong near the room. Right. But I can get the smartest people usually in the room. Sure. And that's a joy. I love that. I love that. And that's where I think that the value of the uh, biz lab is mm -hmm. that we get the right advisors together for a company that's going through, maybe they have a great growth potential, uh -huh. or maybe they're facing a major obstacle. Let's get some people around that so we don't have to reinvent. You're going to make enough mistakes on your own, mm -hmm. so let's get some people who can help you navigate some of the ones that you know they can see coming easily. Sure. So that's, I don't know if I'm answering but yeah. you know, yeah. being a reporter has helped me to kind of dig a little bit as sure. well, you know, kind of get into. Right. So all those investigative uh, skills exactly. are, are right, right on target to helping you get to uh, Hang on to a find the Isn't companies that for me? that's <laughs> the companies uh, that you're working with. Um, one of the things that companies, and it's not just startup companies, but companies in general can struggle with, and if it's not addressed, it creates an issue. Is their story, their brand story? Um, if you kind of don't know who you are, the story of it, you talked, you gave an example of a company that's so focused on the product. And um, startup companies often, you a, a larger company has, they have accounting, they have uh, uh, human resources, they have all these different departments. But your startup company, you really have to come up with all of those. You, the, the, if it's a, a solopreneur, you are all of those team members. Right. Um, is there something that the Biz Lab will offer in terms of helping create that, create that story or build that story f so it's going to be helpful with marketing and promotion, that sort of thing? Yeah, in terms of also helping them with some of those services too, because those are the things that most entrepreneurs don't start their business going. I can't wait to do payroll. I can't wait to offer insurance, you know, or whatever. So, um, so you know, we will be having a lot of service providers coming in mm -hmm. and providing. You know, I've already got some uh, attorneys who are willing to to provide some guidance on those issues. Accountants have already stepped up and said they want to help out. Realize, you know, can I just say that I'm amazed by the generosity of the entrepreneurs we have in this area. Because mm -hmm. they really, you know, a lot of times business gets a bad rap, you know, I mean, like big business and it's like that's a negative word and, and it's selfishness and it's all about profits and, I mean, of course profits are important. Mm -hmm. But a lot of people give a lot of time to sure. a lot of things sure. and um, and don't ask for a single thing in return. And mm -hmm. when I, when I, Tony first um, offered this uh, managing director position, I went to a couple entrepreneurs that I knew who I really respected, and I asked them, number one, their opinion, like if they laughed, which a couple, no, I'm just kidding, but um, you know, what would their thoughts be? And then they started giving me thought, and I go, like, they would be willing to be involved. Mm -hmm. And I go, like, why would you be involved? And they, they said, you know, we want to be, I want to be part of, I want to be part of the community. I want to sure. help raise other companies. We all win when that happens. Sure. Did I answer your question? Yeah, you did. Okay. And I, I think that, that speaks to, Entrepreneurship in general. Uh, I, I found the same uh, type of um, generosity as I have sought speakers, especially in the beginning when I really, you know, kind of embraced this um, initiative and wasn't sure who to, who to, who should I call, who should I ask, who speakers. were, um, and and as a and company excluded. Folks, <laughs> but folks, folks were they were just like I would love to help. I mean, and I think that is a part of you know if there's a job description or a profile of a of an entrepreneur that seems to be it. It's and it, it's it. I think it comes from remembering the journey. True. Uh, and and you know you you you're just kind of filled with this um, knowledge. Uh, and they want to stay in the game. Yeah. They yeah. want to stay in the game. A lot of them, you know, have had successful companies, and then once they hit 50 or they hit 100, it changes a little bit. It's not as fun. So sometimes getting back involved with a company that's at you know two, five, ten mm -hmm. people, it becomes fun again. So they can kind of have their Cake and eat it too. Right, and in, in the course of covering, you know, in the business review and in, in just being, you know, a, a journalist, and I know that you had the opportunity to talk to a lot of entrepreneurs. One of the things that I hear 
Um, and I think, that, again, this is what defines an entrepreneur is the only time you lose is when you quit, is when you stop. That's right. And um, were there you know, interesting stories that you came across that you were able to grab some nuggets, mm -hmm. not necessarily people in particular, but that you were like, oh, you know, I, I kind of, in the course of doing your interviews, I, I grabbed that nugget, um, and, that, and that's something that you're going to be able to give back to folks that come to the New York Biz Lab. Yeah, I mean, I've interviewed many, I've said this many times to people that um, even the people that failed, quote unquote failed, were inspiring to me, because a lot of them have landed in other places, they've done other things. So absolutely, there's, um, you know, they're always looking for that next thing. You know, I mean, I heard one guy say, um, you know, in Silicon Valley, you could be in Starbucks, have a long line at the door, and you could be talking to the guy in front of you going, hey, Charlie, so you still at whatever.com? Oh, no, that was four companies ago. And there's no negative anything. Sure. There's no, sure. like, cloud. Yeah. And they said, you know, we got to change that attitude here in the capital region. It's okay. You know, when I came, one of the refreshing things about working at TransFinder and the business, I was like, it's okay to fail. Sure. You're gonna, if you're going to aim for high things, and there sure. are going to be some things that are not going to always work out exactly the way you plan it. You sure. can't, you know... So yeah, I, I, you know, one other thing that entrepreneurs have told me, one Mike Marvin who was with Map Info was like, you got to take lots of shots on goal. And you take lots of shots on goal. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't. Every shot doesn't make it. So there's a lot of nuggets that you know. I mean, my memory's not what it used to be. So I'm trying to remember those nuggets. Yeah, you know, yeah. But no, that's fine. That's fine. Because um, because I think that it is. It, it, it's something that. Um, you do. You don't. As long as you don't stop. As long as you don't. That's the key. Yeah. Don't stop. Then you um, you keep moving. Because um, uh, I I know, like I say, just in the nine. I think it's. I've been doing this for nine months, so I've had ten interviews that I've had an opportunity to meet just some amazing, um, amazing entrepreneurs. And it, it's the, the the what I keep hearing is it was to solve a problem. There was something that just really was <laughs> was very annoying that they it was a pain point. Um, they wanted to make a difference for their family. They really wanted to um, see some things uh, that were different for their family and, and make a difference for their community. Um, another piece of it that I hear very often has to do with philanthropy. Uh, very often um, there's a, either it's something that's in them already or there's a switch that takes place in the course of um, uh, doing their business. Um, is that something that you saw as well in talking to the entrepreneurs or something that you see a, a piece for in the New York Biz Lab? Giving philanthropy? Back, giving back? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, in terms of the advisors, for sure. In terms of some companies that are on their second company, there's a, you know, we're dealing with some people that are a little bit older, actually. And um, they see a role. We were meeting with some educators today, and they want to be part of helping you know, SCCC specifically mm -hmm. beef up their offerings. Mm -hmm. you know? And so, yeah, I think there's definitely... I lost my train of thought for one second. I was thinking... Yeah, I don't know if you guys know Patrice's story, but mm -hmm. you were, I mean, think about it. I was thinking, you took 10 months you've been doing this, uh -huh. right? Uh, How nervous were you? Oh, golly. How nervous were you the first night in the, it, before anybody showed up? Uh, and you had already invested. Yeah. You had hors d'oeuvres out. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. If you talk to my team, they will, let, he's like laughing. My, my videographer is like, every, at the, at, it, that part never leaves. I mean, I'm, I'm pretty comfortable once I hit the chair and we create the zone. But before that, there's the four hours before the four hours after. I'm pretty much a nutcase. Um, there's an energy there. Right? It, it, there's it, a... But it, it, and um, the thing about entrepreneurship is, and and for those of you who are here that are or are aspiring, it is contagious. It's like a that sick is. disease. It is. It is and um, <laughs> you know, I, I when I started this, when I started, you know, in December. Actually, my first interview was in January. Um, I had a job. I had a full-time job. I worked for the yes. legislature. So right? You had a state I job. Had a, I had a state Gold. job. I had a paycheck. In Albany. State Every two job. weeks, I had good benefits. And through the course of um, it, what, what got me involved in Startup Grind was just really loving the values that the company represents. You know, really um, giving without taking, um, helping another business owner without that sort of tit-for-tat mentality yep. of expecting, yep. I, I do this for you, so next month, you know, or the whole, I'm yep. going to go to an event and I've got victory because I've got 10 business cards. Yes, I'm leaving and I've got 10 business yeah. cards. Yeah. And somewhere along the way, like you say, the, the journalists have this thing that happens where you suddenly want to be a part of. Um, and I'm doing these interviews, I'm meeting these amazing people. I've always had interest. I always did something freelance on the side. And somewhere along the way, I just realized that either I believed 
what I was promoting every month, what I was creating a space like for that. every month. I love that. I either believed it, but I found that um, entrepreneurship, she's not for sissies. Let's just, <laughs> you know, she is not for sissies, but there's a space that's created. Entrepreneurship is she? And so now you know. Not, thought I provoking. Something new to we promised you. That's thought, thought provoking. provoking. That's thought provoking. <laughs> but there's just a space that was created, and I got that restless sort of a, it's a, it's, you know, this thing that I couldn't, I kept coming back to it and I would get so excited um, to do my events and I would be so sad when I had to go back to work on Monday. And I finally began to look at, you know, I, I worked full time, I'm in school half time, finishing up my bachelor's, I was, you know, running this event and I realized that my job was getting in the way with my life. <laughs> my my full time job, yeah. like it was providing um, a salary, uh, it was providing great benefits, but my superpowers were not able to be flexed in the particular job that I had. Yeah. And so I realized that the gifts that we, um, that we have, we have a responsibility to give those back, right? And so the more interviews I did and the more that I learned, um, like you, I discovered that I'm a connector and you know, a convener and you, know, you, you meet the great people and you're like, hey, you know, I think there's someone. And it became about how can I help that person? And I just realized that I couldn't keep my job anymore. It's startup grind made me lose my job. I'm going to write that article <laughs> for LinkedIn. And your boss and tried to talk you out multiple times, gave you many chances to, to rethink to, this. Yeah, and so you, you just kind of reach a point where it is the other piece, you know, I think entrepreneurship comes with uh, the yin yang is the fear factor and the belief. And the belief really comes, I was talking to someone this evening. Where are you? So I was talking to Dan, was it? And we talked about how you fail, but you 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 try and take a, a job and you can't. It's like you know, it's in you. It's it's it. Um, entrepreneurship, well, many of the entrepreneurs I interviewed said they're unemployable. It beca yeah, it becomes it becomes a part. It infuses with your DNA, and so I just realized that my job was getting in the way of my life, and my life was about. Um, uh, I'm I'm put on the planet to engage people and help them tell their stories. That's kind of what I do, Good. and so I could continue to be a safe liver, and there's nothing wrong with the job, but I think you just reach a certain point. I, I like to say, I, I did startup grind for nine months and I conceived my future. <laughs> I conceived my destiny. Nice. And so I had to give birth to it and I quit my job. I love it. And people were like, you quit your job. Or, and I said, well, yeah, you know, it was time for me to start my, my Has company. Has anybody here quit their job to do, start something? <laughs> you know, so you, yeah, yeah, it's, so, you kind of. So you, there's you, a, it's a bunch of amens in here. Yeah, right? so you just, you, you just. Preachers of the choir in this you, church. <laughs> you just reach. Uh, uh, hey. Exactly, I exactly. Am thought provoking. So, <laughs> but, it, but it, it is, you just, I think, um, you just reach a certain point and you'll know when it is. It's not something that um, someone can tell you, um, but you just reach a certain point where that restless feeling, um, it, it just it over it over it just it, it yeah. permeates can't be, you and it can't it be it can't be tamped down and so that's yeah good. so that's so yeah my story awesome. is that I quit a perfectly good job it was really fun trying to explain that to coasted. my dad huh you could have coasted I I could have coasted yeah. but but I really could, it it became it was it was interfering with my life and I just felt that I had a responsibility to do some some other things but to try um, I don't know those who are entrepreneurs to explain to people like that you quit your job and you well what are you doing now. I started the company. Oh, is that right? So where is this company? It's virtual right now, because I can do it from anywhere. Also, that startup grind thing, that's your job. Well, it's my vocation. It's kind of, you know, I, it's a thing I do. It's what made me, it's what made me, you know, quit my job, but it's not the job. So it's, it's an interesting, um, that's where that courage of yeah. your conviction comes into place, where you, you know, there's a fear factor and, I, and that's why I like to say it's like, yeah, I quit my job, and it's 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 really awesome most of the time. And then I have those moments of, my God, what have I done? You know, yeah. um, and then you just you just you have a moment like this where you realize, yeah, it is, or you make a connection for someone else, and you that's realize awesome. that, yeah, and that and that's and that's what it is. So, um, so uh, yeah, that's awesome. Thought thought provoking, noise provoking, but it, I I want to leave some time for folks to ask you some questions. Um, yeah, don't look scared. Oh, well, it's getting late. It is. Oh, oh. So, uh, so yeah. So, uh, we'll open it up. Patrice belong in the lab? Does Patrice belong well, in the lab? Well, now. Do you have an education mm. technology or I, a software? I, no. Maybe. The, you know, I should say there's a one other aspect I didn't mention, and that is service provider type role, maybe if there's a marketing or something that could 
help serve the tenants within the tech company. So, I mean, within the biz lab. So, she hasn't asked me, so. Okay. But she's starting, and she, she's starting a business. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, you know, yeah. She's that's something that's a conversation that we have. Having different kinds of support that you had talked about. Before. Building brand story, engaging people, and helping them to tell their stories. Yeah, it's going to be your company? <laughs> It's the word architect is the name of my company. Architect. The word architect. Yeah, Building. It has a name. Building. Right. Yeah, it has a name. Like it. it has a name. Anybody else? Mission Educational Technology, that's a pretty broad area. Do you have any specific areas you guys think are the really up and coming areas in that space or where they could potentially use? You know, not really, to be honest with you. I mean, it, it, has, a, it has to have a tech component. Like, so it could be the educational games. We were dealing with a, um, a textbook company that's going digital. And um, they've completely changed their whole um, their whole model, really. So they were doing private schools, now they want to do K through 12 public schools. So I think there's a really and it's a growth. The New York, I think, another you know, Wall Street Journal last week had a story about education technology as this. It's just been on a major growth curve. It was an expression that people didn't even know maybe five years ago. Education mm -hmm. technology. So I, I don't really want to say I'm limiting it. It really has to fit. You know, is it, do you need programmers? Do you need developers? We want to have a bullpen of developers that can help. And we do have developers that oversee a TransFinder that if you had a company that was hitting a roadblock, we need to put some muscle around it for a certain time period just to get them over that hump and then they go back and work on something else. So, you know, it has to have a tech component to it. Did I answer that? Yeah. Okay. Uh, you know, in the experience of entrepreneurs, whether in college or just graduating, you haven't had the savings necessary to kind of launch your own venture, and you don't have the experience really to attract angel investors. So, how do you kind of see a way to bridge that gap, or are you doing anything you to get to investment them? investment into these uh, tech companies? Yeah, because before they can raise angel investment, they need some something. But yeah. if you're young entrepreneurs, they may not have the seed funds necessary themselves to uh, launch and get off the ground. Yeah. Um, there's that gap between academic R&D and venture capital. Yep. Um, actually, a book came, about, came out about it last December. Uh, so I was wondering you know, what you're kind of doing in that space. Great question. Uh, you read that just right off the card I gave you. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I do not know this man. I've never met him. Um, <laughs> no, that's a great question because one of the things, we're, a couple of things. Um, we are working with investors that are, you know, I, I think one number one, you want to talk to people and like, you don't need the $10 million. You know, you don't need to, you know, that's, I think, a recipe for, can be a recipe for disaster. So I think the goal is, what do you really need to get by? You know, we've met with some companies, and even before I came on, they met with some people who were like, we want $10 million, $5 million to pay us, you know, or whatever. And like, really? Or they want to, no, that's, they want to pay themselves. And like, no, entrepreneurs don't pay themselves. They get, you know, macaroni and cheese for 50 cents and, you know, all that kind of thing. So what I'm working on right now, which is actually, I've been told, and it's, I, I get zero credit, by the way. I, any ideas I have, i got to give God all the credit or my good friends and people. But I, if I have a good idea, I know that it came from something else. But I'm working with people who have been, I don't want to use the word disenfranchised, but they're not included in the conversation on investments. And I'm looking for, like, 100. Right now I'm working out with 20. Um, people who have been who are wealthy who have made it. So I'm just going to give some generic names, but people like auto salespeople. I'm not going to name any, but like something that might be like huge. Try to go to certain people, <laughs> or or pe I'm not I'm not saying that that's a certain person, but you know people who have made it who never get asked to be part of the startup community. They're asked to be part of funding my 18-hole golf tournament. But those people are business people and they're entrepreneurs and they can provide a, uh, not just money, so, but they can also provide guidance. So I'm trying to put together this stable of investors that are not really in, uh, in the conversation at all, who maybe just want to say 10,000, 20,000, 30,000. And to you and me, at least to me, that's a lot of money. But to some of these guys, that's like a watch, you know? So no big deal. So I'm trying to get some of those guys and say, look at, and I talked to some CEOs, so this was, so, and like a couple of them said, look it, I want to be at the table. I want to be part of that conversation. And I can go to my buddy over here who we know each other because we both did a startup 10 years ago and we're on our next thing. And we can together maybe put together $30,000 and come up with a deal. My role, part of my role is to connect them with those people. It's also to be protective of the companies. So I see myself as 
we have a very high standard of the people we want to be advisors. You can imagine a lot of people would probably want to be part of this. And I don't want to ever say no to people, but there's other roles for people. But to be an advisor, that's a very, I think that's a sacred role, to be honest with you. And I heard something at actually a boss event. And so I'll just give some credit to boss. Someone was talking about the idea of protege. And so instead of mentee, which I don't like that word anyway, mentee, like manatee or whatever, <laughs> but mentor, protege has this thing of means protection. There's a protection. And so it's really important that when these deals do happen, that everyone's on the same table, that you're, um, someone is not being greedy, and that there's an understanding that, okay, you, maybe you make a couple bucks on this company, but not at their expense, and not in the, that it will actually hurt its growth. So does that answer your question? The goal is to get a wide uh, group of investors and then find the right ones that fit this company. And maybe it's, a, maybe it's 100,000 or 50,000. That's not, you're not gonna get rich on that. That might be just enough to get you to pay the rent for five months. So you, you do that in your own network or is there kind of a formal idea you're reaching out? No, I'm building the network. You wanna be part of the network? Oh you have ten thousand dollars. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it sounds like I'm just going to interject. It sounds like you're trying to build a league of extraordinary investors. What's the acronym for that? B it is L E I. L -E -I. Um, but yeah, something. Yeah. Because I'm a namer. I name I like things. That. Make up names. Instantly yeah. know what it is. Yeah. Well, we're calling it actually the New York Biz Lab Virtual Fund. Oh, okay. It has a name. Yeah. Scratch off the league of the Well, I like that. Investor. That no, might be a sub. That's fine. You've already got something. <laughs> Anybody else? It's actually, the investment model that you just described sounds a lot like an on the street version of crowdfunding, but much more targeted. It still has that same community feel. Yeah. And it sounds to me like New York Biz Labs, where you're describing it, has a social entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship aspect. That's good. Like and that. um, I'm wondering if you. You feel that, and if that's part of the core component as well, sort of the, the social entrepreneurship about the economy. I think so. Yeah, I agree with you. I think if people see that the uh, what is the expression from Aristotle telling me? the whole is bigger than the sum of its parts. So it's hard to say that. So I want to think it too. But people are feeding into this. They want to believe in this. The difference between the, the Kickstarter type thing too, though, is that you get to have a faith. I don't think it's just, some people may just want to give $10,000, but to be honest with you, I actually want them to be part of it. I want them to be at the table and have them be able to kick around ideas. And it's like, it's okay <coughs> that not everybody's going to agree. You know, when, you know, people, you know, in this room, we probably could come up with a lot of things in terms of business that one group will say, no, I, you know, I was at some forum the other day where someone said, sometimes you got to give away things for free. And that's how you get business. And then somebody else said, I completely disagree with that guy. You never give away anything for free. You devalue yourself. You know, that's okay. Those discussions are worthwhile. And usually there's some truth in the middle, or it may work for one situation and not for another situation. But I definitely see a social component to this. And that's part of the reason why I really do want to go to the people who have been successful, but I really do not feel like they're part of the, the, the equation at all. So like, they really are asked over and over and over again, Will you fund this Boys and Girls Club? Which is all really good. Will you dump water over your head for this no, cause? I will not. I will but, not. You know, <laughs> but how about, would you help this company of these two or three guys, guys and guys, I say guys, by the way, sexually neutral or whatever, gender neutral. So anyway, help these guys, you know, and that's giving back to the community too. It may not seem like it, you know, because you can actually make some money on it, but I think it is giving back to the community. Anybody else? A reporter. You mentioned it. <laughs> <laughs> it's scary when I see that. Columns. Columns. Um, oh, that's even worse. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned quirky before. Um, and did I? Yeah, at the very I don't remember that. I denied that. Okay. <laughs> so I was good. Um, is there any synergy?
are they totally do you see it they're different but there's a relationship and we do have a very good relationship with quirky they in fact when they had their first batch of 30 employees were hired they came over to our building because they because you can get a perfect view of quirky from our building <laughs> and so they want to get a picture of quirky in the background so i've been in their offices several times and um we think that there is some i don't know it hasn't been formalized there might be some synergies you know it certainly is not i mean a somebody, bad, it's a I great can, thing i can see somebody taking taking an idea to quirky uh quirky taking it to market that person, yeah, they buy patents then, usually seeing, or, then that person saying well gee this, this is there's more to it that i have more ideas relating to it and maybe i want to take it to market myself and have my own business uh, they yeah. can knock on your door and if you wonder about but we'll always answer the door <laughs> that's our motto we always i just know that <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't make any sense I don't know. I mean, I, we 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 like Quirky. We're very glad they're here. Really, it's a good thing for the for the whole region I mean, for Schenectady specifically. It's a great logo. It's a great oh, logo. Yeah. yeah. Anyone else? So, if companies or company wannabes are interested, they've uh, like I've got to find out some more information about the New York Biz Lab. What should they do? Well, they can talk to me here tonight. They could also go to, um, I guess the best thing would be to email me, which is uh, rderico, R-D-E-R-R-I-C-O, at New York NY Biz Lab, B-I-Z-L-A-B dot com. New okay. York Biz Lab. New York Biz Lab com. Rick, thank you so much. Thank if you. We are, it's been a pleasure. Uh, if we, um, we, have, we have no other questions. I uh, just want to talk about um, next month uh, okay. on November the 12th. It is boss day. It, well, but, but you're during after. the day. See? You, so you're you come, the day, to right? and come to come boss to start and have a completely blowout day. Uh, our next guest is going to be Joshua Drew. And Joshua is a senior tech evangelist from Microsoft BizSpark. So they reached out to us and uh, are really interested in coming. We're going to have an interview. Um, uh, Joshua is also going to give us uh, some pointers. Those who don't know what BizSpark is, BizSpark for years had been positioned towards software developers. And it's a suite of about $15,000 worth of product services, access to the cloud, that they make available to companies. But they realize that this is also good stuff for small companies as well. So um, he will actually be having, um, making available some codes oh. that companies can come. Uh, and the eligibility is, is not super rigorous. Uh, you know, it's encourage you just to come out, check it out. Uh, it's going to be a great event. He's actually going to make codes available so um, he can kind of quick qualify you um, to get a code. You can test drive these products for three years uh, at no cost. It's wow. amazing. I mean, it's web service, the service in the cloud, uh, web hosting. Uh, I, I don't know all of the things that, that they're right available. Here. I'm sorry? The event's right here? Yes, it is right here at over it at our venue, uh, our venue sponsor over it. I'm just trying to peek here at some of those things. Um, BizSpark is a, it's a global program, free software, support and visibility to help startups succeed. Three year program, it's free of charge. Uh, software, support, visibility, I said that. Um, so when you come to this event, what you're gonna learn is how BizSpark can benefit your business, even if you're not a tech business or developer. Why partnering with Microsoft may be the smartest move you ever make for your business. How to leverage BizSpark for operational needs, web development, mobile gaming, and more. And about uh, Microsoft has some other startup friendly programs like Microsoft Ventures and the Spark Plus. So you want to check that out. That's Wednesday, November the 12th, again at 6 p.m. right here at Over It. I um, also want to let you know about one more event that's coming up that has to do with startups uh, in November. Startup Week in Saratoga 3 is back. So that's pretty exciting. And Startup Weekend is, again, we're powered, we're one of the startup communities that's powered by Google for Entrepreneurs. And so is Startup Weekend. Startup Weekend is a, an international program. Uh, it's a collaborative, it's an intense 54-hour event which focuses on innovation and the formation of uh, businesses over the course of a weekend. So it's kind of neat. Teams will come together, bring your ideas, uh, you'll be formed into some teams, there'll be coaching available. Um, and the organizer for that is uh, Robert uh, Manassier uh, from InFocus Brands. Um, and I can get you, anyone that's interested, they're looking for sponsorships. Um, some pretty uh, appealing sponsorship programs are available. And I'm also, in as well. well, there you have it. Thanks, well. Kevin. You got the, you've got the information. Well. Awesome. Well. Okay, I didn't realize that. Well, thank you for uh, thank you for saying that. So you can get information from Kevin, uh, and he probably will say it much more eloquently and more fully than I will.
<laughs> so uh, if that is it, I think we are complete. And so we just want to thank you all for coming out tonight. Thank you. Uh, and Rick, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.